Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome back to the Adventures in History Land YouTube channel. Today I am teaming up once more with my friend Brandon F, and we are picking up where we left off to tell you what the Boston Tea Party was all about. But rather than go through a blow-by-blow -blow of what happened, we want to share some contemporary attitudes to what was happening to help contextualise the deepening political divide that occurred between Britain and the colonies of North America. You'll remember from the last video on Brandon's channel that the British Prime Minister, Lord North, had, based on outrages committed in Boston, urged the government to take a different course with the colonies. He cited instances of plunder and arson. You'll also remember that Brandon spoke of other tea parties taking place inspired by the famous one in Boston. What, I hear you ask, was the use of these dramatic acts, these nefarious tea parties, that could cause Lord North to advise a stronger hand deal with a colonial problem. How did Bostonians think that they could destroy property like this and hope to be seen as the bigger men, righteously upholding their cause? To answer these questions, we must turn to the sources. Over to you, Brandon. Thank you, Josh. In the 1957 horror film, Johnny Tremaine, we get an outright jolly vision of the Boston Tea Party with bright-eyed and smiling Sons of Liberty parading easily through the streets, singing a jaunty tune after a most quiet and orderly dumping of tea into the harbor. However, just as this was not an event of genteel disagreement, nor was it this uncontrollable riot spreading through the streets and destroying everything in its path with a thin veil of politics as justification. It was mob violence, yes, but it wasn't without purpose, and that was the narrative at least being put forward by the Whigs in Boston, that this wasn't just mad rioting, but a justified, disciplined, and proportionate response to injustices levied on Boston, whose people were given no other recourse. For example, listen to how the Boston Gazette is describing the events just a few days after the fact on December 20th, 1773. On Tuesday last, the body of the people of this and all the adjacent towns, and others from the distance of twenty miles, assembled at the Old South Meeting House to inquire the reason of the delay in sending the ship Dartmouth with the East India Tea back to London, and having found that the owner had not taken the necessary steps for that purpose, they enjoined him at his peril to demand of the collector of the customs a clearance for the ship, and appointed a committee of ten to see it performed, after which they adjourned to the Thursday following ten o'clock. They then met, and being informed by Mr. Roch that a clearance was refused him, they enjoined him immediately to enter protest, and apply to the governor for a passport by the castle, and adjourned again till three o'clock for the same day. At which time they again met, and after waiting till near sunset, Mr. Roch came in and informed them that he had accordingly entered his protest, and waited on the governor for a pass. But His Excellency told him that he could not, consistent with his duty, grant it until his vessel was qualified. The people finding all of their efforts to preserve the property of the East India Company and return it safely to London, frustrated by the tea consignees, the collector of the customs, and the governor of the province, dissolved their meeting. But behold what followed! A number of brave and resolute men, determined to do all in their power to save their country from the ruin which their enemies had plotted, in less than four hours emptied every chest of tea on board the three ships commanded by the captains Hall, Bruce, and Coffin, amounting to 340 two chests into the sea, without the least damage done to the ships or any other property. The matters and owners are well pleased that their ships are thus cleared, and the people are almost universally congratulating each other on this happy event. And perhaps most notably here, the paper outright states that the colonists were doing their utmost to protect the property of the East India Company by sending it back to London. And unfortunately, those efforts were dashed by an intractable government with no interest in helping reach a fair conclusion for all parties. And meanwhile, it's also emphasizing that not only was the actual dumping of the tea not a formal decision on the part of popular Whig leaders, but rather a spontaneous action by men acting independently in pursuit of some common good, but it's also taking care to specify that the only property destroyed was the tea. No damage being done to the ships or other cargo, nobody being hurt, even the owners of the ship being happy with it all. Uh, in a way, it really isn't that far off from Johnny Tremaine. Uh, a restrained communal protest over a legitimate grievance. The only thing lacking here is the jolly singing. 
And this wasn't only being published in the Bostonian newspapers either. This narrative is very, very popular. In fact, doing a quick search on the British newspaper archive, it took me all of five seconds to find this account from the Derby Mercury dated to the 6th of May, 1774, and published as an extract of a letter from Newport, Rhode Island, dated to March 14th of the same year. It read, quote, the inhabitants of Boston would have had the tea returned to London, comfortable in their resolutions in December last, and the customs house officers were waited upon and requested to consent to its being returned. But the usual obstacles being thrown in the way, well, no method was left to prevent the introduction of that dutied article, but the destruction of it. Now let's compare this to how the government are looking at these events. You've probably heard the famous quote from Lord North when addressing Parliament over the affair, quote, The Americans have tarred and feathered your subjects, they've plundered your merchants, burnt your ships, denied all obedience to your laws and authority. Yet so clement and so long forbearing has our conduct been that it is incumbent on us now to take a different course. Whatever may be the consequences, we must risk something. If we do not, all is over. And in that, North was referring to far more than just the Boston Tea Party and even the other Tea Parties besides. He was referring to what had become a long history now of colonial resistance, not merely to taxation, but parliamentary authority and its representatives, including far more violent instances of, yes, actual rioting in the streets and the attacking of Crown representatives. But it's also worthwhile, I think, to look at the opening words of the Boston Port Act, uh, the 1774 policy which effectively closed the Port of Boston. It was the first of the so-called Intolerable Acts. Appropriate for a government document, it doesn't take on quite so existential or dramatic a turn, but it's presenting the policy as a one of unfortunate necessity for the safety of British customs officials and resulting from select individuals, presumably a minority, who are, through their misdeeds, basically ruining the fun for everyone else, the good and loyal citizens of Boston. It reads as such. Whereas dangerous commotions and insurrections have been fomented and raised in the town of Boston, in the province of Massachusetts Bay in New England, by diverse ill-affected persons, to the subversion of His Majesty's government, and to the utter destruction of the public peace and good order of the said town, in which commotions and insurrections certain valuable cargoes of tea, being the property of the East India Company, and on, bo on board certain vessels within the bay or harbor of Boston, were seized and destroyed, and whereas in the present condition of of the said town and harbor, the commerce of His Majesty's subjects cannot be safely carried on there, nor the customs payable to His Majesty duly collected, and it is therefore expedient that the officers of His Majesty's customs should be forthwith removed from the said town. And in that view, the, the manner in which such diverse ill-affected persons seek to frame what happened and why doesn't particularly matter. And in that view, the manner in which these diverse ill-affected persons seek to frame what happened and why it happened doesn't really matter. Whether it was this massive mob shouting with torches and pitchforks, uh, or uh, a secret cabal planned from the start by rebellious officials, uh, or, as the newspapers are trying to frame it, this spontaneous act of patriotism carried out uh, very, very quietly, polite, and businesslike, uh, it's irrelevant. Parliament is officially saying, at least in these particular words, we don't care how or why it happened or who did it, because what happened happened. Immensely valuable cargoes were seized and destroyed and continue to be across the entire colony. The government's officials are being threatened, even tortured. So we're going to withdraw those officials and we're going to stop giving you cargo to destroy. It makes sense. It's practical. It just so happens that this particular policy is also being applied to a deeply ideological battle. And as such, of course, it takes on an infinitely deeper meaning where those moral claims, uh, the who and the how these events took place, really do matter a great deal. And you can see those being addressed in those more broad speeches by men like Lord North, regardless of whether the official policies are really acknowledging it. And the very precarious, the very delicate nature in which so many individuals around this issue are talking about what happened really does speak, I think, to just how delicate the situation was. 
In a way, you might even say that what actually happened during the Boston Tea Party doesn't really matter anywhere near so much as how people were thinking that it happened. And with that, back over to you, Josh. Thank you, Brandon. So undoubtedly, both sides were finding a great many things intolerable about the other. And as we've seen, while perhaps Whitehall might have been accused of overlooking or ignoring the political motivations and ideology at play regarding the disturbances in Boston, it was certainly not blind to the fact that outrages, whether orderly or disorderly, were being perpetrated against the King's customs officials. And it wasn't just in Boston, nor was it only customs officials that were getting caught up in this whirlwind of outrage and counter-outrage. An article in the April 13th, 1775 edition of the Maryland Gazette, written by a pseudonym called Americanus, offered what they stated to be evidence from the public ledger relating to a riot in Annapolis regarding a shipment of tea, that detestable weed, the broad details being that two merchants found themselves in a the ticklish position of receiving a shipment of tea that they had ordered before such a cargo became the beverage of traitors, and rather than risk committing a daring insult to the liberties of America, elected not to return the cargo to London, but to burn said cargo and indeed their ship the Peggy Lee with their own hands. In a later edition, the owners of the tea can be seen to be desperate to clear their name of being in collusion with the hated tea agents, who would, as current rhetoric ran, so willingly condemn America and the souls of its people to the care of the devil. Smeared with the stain of the pernicious weed, the owners tried to lay out their case to the people, and in so doing shows us that it wasn't just outright loyalists or crown officials who would be targeted for the principle of representation. These events stand as examples that measures to protect property and order, no matter if they were justified in a purely practical sense, were bound to stoke the fires of indignation and entrench the North American Whigs all the more. For by standing to their principle and incurring the anger of Lord North, they were proving that to the government in Whitehall it really was just a matter of tea and property, and this would be an oversight with great repercussions. But like they say, hindsight is twenty twenty, and to be honest, in 1774 there just wasn't a simple answer to the questions being raised by the patricians of Massachusetts and Maryland, that in reality had very little to do with the devilish brew consigned to Boston Harbour.